Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Manuel Castells, who is Professor of Sociology and Professor of City and Regional Planning at the University of California at Berkeley. A social theorist, Professor Castells has won the C. Wright Mills Award, and he has received the Robert and Helen Lind Award from the American Sociological Association for his lifelong contribution to the field of community and urban sociology. Manuel, thank you for being here today. Thank you, Harry. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Spain. Uh, I was born in a small town in, in La Mancha, like Don Quixote. And <laughs> then uh, I grew up mainly in several places, but mainly in Barcelona. Uh, and I stayed in Spain until the age of 20 when I had to move to Paris. Tell us about your parents. How, in retrospect, do you think they shaped your character? Well, my, my parents were very good parents. Uh, it was a conservative family, very strongly conservative family. But I wouldn't say that I think the main thing that shaped my character beyond my parents was the fact that I grew up in fascist Spain. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for people of the young generation to, to realize what that means, even for the Spanish young generation, mm -hmm. but it's still it, it you have actually to resist to the whole environment and to be yourself you have to fight and to politicize yourself from the age of 15, 16. So in a way you, you, you instinctively come not to believe in the authorities? Uh, by definition uh, authority for me was uh, betrayal and lie. Mm -hmm. And uh, were you active in politics at all? Uh, Very much. I, I, I uh, joined this, the student anti-Frankist movement at the age of 16. I entered the university at the age of 16. And um, I was so active that by the age of 20, I was a political exile in Paris. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the authorities knew about you and wanted you either in jail or out of the country? No, out of the country, no. In jail and torture. Uh, that's what happened, unfortunately, to um, all my friends who in 1962 at the University of Barcelona, they raided uh, uh, tens of students and they were tortured, sent to jail and spent quite a few years in jail. And, and, and this was happening in the heart of, uh, of Europe, in a way. But remember, at that time, the Pyrenees were a real barrier. Mm -hmm. And Spain was only, in fact, uh, supported and acknowledged by the US government. But uh, most of the European countries were boycotting not diplomatic relations, but most relationships with Spain. And so uh, when did you leave the country? Uh, what, what education did you get in the country and what out of the country? Well, I was studying l both law and economics in, in Barcelona, the University of Barcelona. I studied four years and then, but I couldn't finish. Spanish degrees were five years uh, degrees at the university. So I finished in Paris. Uh, I finished uh, first the law and economics and then I went into a doctorate of sociology at the Sorbonne. And, and what drew you in, into sociology and into the topics that you wound up working on? I would say basically my interest in social change. Um, I, I probably would say that if I would have been in a normal country, um, the law uh, field attracted me very much, and uh, economics also, but uh, being driven into the necessity of social change, first in Spain and then later on in France, sociology was a discipline that was more open, more intellectually open, uh, less, um, less dominated by uh, a an, an narrow view of the wall and things are as they are and you cannot move them. So the notion of integrating my intellectual activity, my professional activity and the possibility of, of contributing to some form of social change and betterment of society was appearing to me as actually I would say to most sociologists. And where where were you uh, in the 60s? Where you were you were in France and were you still a student or or, or what? Well, no. In fact, uh, in the 60s, in in the case of France, you mean 1968, which was the May 68 movement. And in fact, I I became a very young assistant professor at the University of Paris. Uh, at the age of 24 at, uh, in, in 1966 and I was uh, appointed at the uh, uh, new campus, the new sociology department in the campus of Nanterre. It was a, a new campus of the University of Paris with very good full professors like Alain Touraine, Henri Lefebvre, Fernando Gardoso. And, um, 
I was therefore an assistant professor of sociology in the Nanterre campus in 1968, and this is exactly in that department, in that campus, <laughs> that the 1968 movement started. So I, I would not say I was a leader of the movement, but I was certainly a participant in the movement, and the leader of the movement was directly my student, Daniel Convendit, now a very important political figure in Europe. Mm -hmm. And you write in your trilogy, you say, uh, uh, talking about the broader impact on society, the cultural movements of the 1960s and the early 70s, 60s in their affirmation of individual autonomy against both capital and the state placed a renewed stress on the politics of identity. Absolutely. And, and actually they had tremendous consequences even on the technology of, of our society and this wonderful technological revolution was shaped by the cultural values of freedom. For instance, the simple notion of a personal computer. A personal computer, mm -hmm. certainly in the Soviet Union, was subversive by definition. Mm -hmm. uh, typewriters were forbidden. Uh, and in the capitalist society, uh, personal computer was not something that, that was even thought by, by major companies. was still the time which uh, as IBM was saying that by the year 2000 would be between five and ten computers in the world uh, entirely, or uh, the time where, where in the 1970s when, when uh, the, the leader of the digital corporation said, who would like to have a computer at home? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, this notion mm -hmm. of appropriating in terms of the values and interests of the individual, of, of groups, of communities, uh, the most extraordinary transformations in technology, etc., was, was really uh, uh, alien to that culture. And through the 1960s cultural movement, our categories of thinking changed. And to some extent, identity, personal identity, but also all kinds of collective identities, religious, national, gender, ethnic identity, appear at the forefront of our societies. So that, in fact, the, the entire rationalist world that both uh, liberalism and Marxism had produced in terms of uh, diluting who people are into abstract categories such as worker and consumer or the working class, these abstractions uh, were in fact receding uh, on the basis of a redefinition of cultural values around one's identity. And, and this, the, what you're talking about now really became the, the, the primary focus of your studies, namely that interface uh, between uh, 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 technology and uh, the social milieu, the, the social structure in, in which it uh, appears, and then uh, the dynamic between those two. Exactly. Uh, it's what I, I call the relationship between the, the net and the self. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many people would agree that our societies are uh, being totally redefined by uh, electronically based information technologies and that this is really creating a, a new world, not the technology itself, but the uses of this technology on the basis of social and economic and political interests. But what I think is specific to the kind of research I have tried to do is to show that societies as usual are not simply determined by one dimensional development, let's say techno-economic development, but by the interaction between techno-economic development and what people want to do uh, with this techno-economic development in terms of who they are and uh, in what they believe and what they would like uh, to happen in the world. And this has been quite fundamentally built in terms of identity, of different kinds of identities mm -hmm. uh, in the last uh, 10 years. So our world seems to be shaped by the interaction between these two trends. When the two trends get together, uh, then you have an extraordinary uh, socially rooted technological development expressing identity. When they split and oppose to each other, like for instance in the case of exclusion of, of many people in the world from the networks of power, information and wealth, then is identity versus the, the networks and, and in that sense we witness the, the potentiality of a social crisis of great dimension because it's like uh, the, the way we work and the way we feel don't go together. You, you've given us some, some for, formidable uh, theories and, and great insights in, into this nexus that you're talking about. Before we go into that further, let, let's talk a little about 
being a social theorist, uh, thinking about the world, thinking about it, uh, using your imagination, but also kind of grounded in empirical reality. Well, what does it take to do social theory? What skills? Well, you see, the, it's, it's for me, in a very personal version, it's a combination of being attentive to the world and rigorous enough to capture what happens in the world, and then being able to theorize it, generalize it, and take the broad picture. In, in, what happened to me is on, on the one, I, I was trained in, in, in Paris. I was trained by, in my opinion, the greatest uh, theoretical sociologist of, of, uh, of my time, which uh, was uh, uh, Alain Touraine. Uh, but, um, both with Alain Turin and all the other major uh, sociologists, uh, Foucault, sociologists in the broad sense, social theories, uh, Foucault, Althusser, Poulancet, uh, uh, all of them were to a large extent able to provide broad views of society, but their connection to what actually was mm -hmm. happening in the world. The case of Turing was better, but in most cases, the training I would receive in Paris was purely abstract and theoretical. Uh, I also learned methodology, etc., etc., but that was not the emphasis. Mm -hmm. The emphasis was on theory. One of the reasons I moved to Berkeley in 1979 when I was professor in Paris for 12 years and then I accepted a professorship in Berkeley, one of the main reasons is that what I really was interested in is in combining empirical research with theorizing, mm -hmm. which in, now in the American university system is the other problem. Uh, there is a, a complete split mm -hmm. in most cases between empirical research and theorizing. So in, in France it's just theorizing, or it was just theorizing. In, in the American university system was by and large Empirical, empirically oriented, and theory was kind of a marginal operation in some departments, like, like Berkeley was a, an important one, but most departments just would emphasize um, empirical research. So for me, what I think uh, it's central in, in, my, in my intellectual activity is that I do what some people have called grounded theory. That is, I literally cannot think without observing and understanding what's going on in the world. It's a lot of work to do that, mm -hmm. but at least I feel that they are not, I'm not playing with words. I'm not constructing, deconstructing, reconstructing, but actually trying to make sense of what I observe. So is this, for me, this is social theory. The rest is philosophy on the one hand and social statistics on the and other. And what are the sources of that focus, do you think, in, in your background? What led you to be that way? I, I would say two things. First, my, my double combination of, of French training and, and American academic involvement, mm -hmm. which came even before I came to Berkeley because I was visiting professor for several uh, times at the University of Wisconsin and other places. And on the other hand, I would say my political interest in social change um, taught me the dangers of being extremely dogmatic and ideological uh, in, in terms of if you try to mold the world into your categories, uh, then it doesn't work. And if it works, it's worse, because then that means that you are strangling the world to fit it mm -hmm. into what you think it should be, mm -hmm. uh, rather than starting with what's happening really in life. So I would say a, a, someone interested in social change Mm -hmm. while having general ideas about society, has to be very attentive to society, or in other words, doesn't proceed with social change. So you, 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 in other words, you have to be pragmatic and realistic. And so the combination of trying to actually influence social change mm -hmm. and not simply ideologies about social change. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, this institutional environment being a mixture of, of uh, American and, and, and the French academic world could help. So ultimately you can say that my, 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 my biography being a Spanish and therefore forced to think about <laughs> social change. <laughs> French, therefore theoretically <laughs> trained. And then American academic, therefore sensitive to what was empirical observation and methodology. This combination of my life actually is expressing my way and, of theorizing. And the other interesting element is that it stayed with you. Uh, uh, just 
uh, here you are in Berkeley, uh, right near the, the revolution in Silicon Valley, but what is uh, stri quite striking in your work is the, the search for case studies for comparative purposes. So, so, you, you, uh, so this, this journey, I guess, on your part, I'm, I'm asking and asserting at the same time, uh, led you to, to really uh, uh, have the globe as your laboratory, to look for all kinds of cases to make comparison. Th that's been important, right? Absolutely. Uh, it, the, the fact that at the age of 20, I have to reconstruct my life in a different country, in a different culture, and then, then later on, I, I came to the United States. So, I, I am tricultural, if you wish, uh, at least. <laughs> uh, and, and also, uh, I had very early a, a strong interest for Latin America, uh, where I was first in 1968 in Chile, and, and, and I kept very close contact with people like Fernando Enrique Cardoso, currently the president of Brazil, but my personal friend for 35 years. Uh, and so the notion that uh, when I started to my, my work on, on the information technology revolution, in 1983-84, um, uh, at that time it was, ob it was it became obvious to me two things: that something very important was going on, and that in Europe, from where I was coming, we didn't have a real, uh, real uh, feeling for it. Certainly, we knew about electronics and everything, mm -hmm. but uh, to feel it as I felt it in 1980, for instance, when I when I landed in Berkeley. Uh, it's a very different thing than just to understand it. So that was clear to me that something very important was going on, and I wanted to, to, to understand it. But it was also clear that to understand it was not to understand just Silicon Valley or just California, but see how this extraordinary transformation would interact with culture, societies, institutions throughout the world. It's like uh, if someone would have studied the Industrial Revolution and capitalism only in, in, in England. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the notion was how to build an, a, an observation system in which the theory that would emerge would emerge from the simultaneous observation of as many places as I was able to, and I ended up studying at the same time California and Europe and Latin America, uh, the Asian Pacific and, and the Soviet Union. Your trilogy is on the network society. Help us understand the defining feature uh, of that society uh, uh, and how it differed from what came before. Well, as you well said before, in fact, my trilogy is on the interaction between mm -hmm. the network society and the power of identity and social movements. It's that interaction mm -hmm. which I think defines our, our world. Um, so, uh, in, in that sense, my trilogy is one, two, three. The network society is the new techno-economic uh, system. The, the power of identity is the, the key, the salient trend in terms of social movements and politics, uh, adapting, resisting, counteracting the network society. And then the result of these two elements uh, expresses itself in the tra macro transformations of the world, which I describe in the, in the first volume, uh, The End of Millennium. Uh, the network society itself, um, uh, it's in fact the social structure which is characteristic of what people had been calling for years the information society or post-industrial society. Both post-industrial society and information society are descriptive terms that do not provide the substance, that are not analytical enough. So it's not a matter of changing words, it's providing substance. And the, w the definition, if you wish, in, 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 in concrete terms of a network society is a society where the key, the key social structures and uh, activities are organized around electronically processed information networks. So it's not just about networks or social networks, because social networks had been uh, very old forms of social organization. Mm -hmm. It's about social networks which process and manage information and are using microelectronic based technologies. And, and when, when that happens, when, when that, uh, the, the, these new structures come into play, the, the capacity of uh, the society to process uh, uh, information and to learn has an extraordinary consequences, does it not? Absolutely. Uh, because, yeah, just take, let's take an example. Um, the, the global economy. 
the global economy is not the same thing that the world economy of a highly internationalized economy is not. Because the global economy is based on the ability of uh, the core activities of the global economy, meaning money, uh, capital markets, um, production systems, uh, management systems, information, to work as a unit in real time on a planetary scale, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, at this point we can process, uh, uh, and we do, uh, billions and billions of dollars in seconds, uh, and that can change from values to values, from markets to markets, to currencies to currencies, uh, which increases the complexity, the size, and ultimately the volatility of global financial markets around the world, which makes, in fact, impossible any kind of autonomy of financial markets in one country or one place vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in the global system, which therefore makes extremely difficult any kind of monetary and budget policy which does not take into, into, take into consideration the global financial market. This changes uh, the economic policy, the economic autonomy of governments, and ultimately the relationship between governments and the economy. So, and this is only possible because of deregulation and liberalization that took place in the 1980s in, in, in most countries, and the existence of an infrastructure of telecommunications, information systems, and fast transportation systems that provide uh, the, 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 the technological capacity for this system to work as a unit on a global scale. And, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, institutions that's in the path of this phenomena you're describing is the state. Really. Absolutely. And, and it, what does it discover? That, that it, uh, in essence it's losing control of, of some of its uh, uh, ability to manage its own economy, to ensure its own self social welfare policies and so on? Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't mean that the states uh, disappeared, the nation states disappeared. Let me just mm -hmm. first say that. Uh, but the degrees of freedom of nation states have extraordinarily shrunk in the in in, in the in the last uh, ten years. Uh, in some areas of the world, it has become explicit. Let's say the European Union. Uh, the European Union uh, governments uh, uh, and the, from the the, the the continent, the entire continent, decided to get together so that together they could have some level of bargaining power and some leverage to control global flows of wealth information and power. Um, and they built a, a, a series of institutions which is not a federal state. It's still based on nation states but also on supranational institutions uh, which share sovereignty and also decentralize sovereignty to local regional governments and then also uh, subcontract sovereignty to international institutions such as NATO in terms of the uh, armed uh, forces. So what we have, for instance, in the case of Europe, it's a uh, complex system of institutional relations, which I call the network state, mm -hmm. because in fact it's a network of interactions of shared sovereignty. Under different forms, you have a similar situation in most of the world. Uh, in, in, in Latin America, uh, while some states are with others, but the main thing is that the key economic conditions are governed in connection with international institutions like the International Monetary Fund, like different uh, trade treaties, Mercosur or the Andean Pact or the connection to the North American uh, Free uh, Trade uh, Pact. So, uh, in, in other words, states operate, still exist, but operate as actors of a much more complex and interacting uh, network. Even in the case of the United States, uh, few people think that the United States uh, can act alone and impose conditions, both in military or economic terms. To start with, it's not the US government, but the Federal Reserve Bank that has some some kind of economic policy, but this economic policy is highly conditioned and shaped by the interaction with the global financial markets. Alan Grisman does not control the global financial market. He, he follows uh, mm -hmm. and, and creates conditions for the economy to perform better under the conditions of the constraints created by the global financial markets. And the same thing we could say in technology networks, in, 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 in flows of 
trade and flows of, of information. So the notion here is not the disappearance of the state, of the nation state. It's the transformation mm -hmm. of a world based on sovereign nation states in a world of interdependent, uh, sharing sovereignty nation states. And so someone like Alan Greenspan is just better positioned to respond to these global flows than uh, another state, for example. Uh, that not in other states, because I would say Alan Greenspan, it's, it's an independent mm -hmm. uh, economic authority. Uh, in principle, after appointed, he doesn't mm -hmm. follow the instructions of the president or the instructions of the Congress. Right. Right. Uh, so in that sense, let's say the International Monetary Fund is largely autonomous of a specific set of instructions. Alan Greenspan is largely autonomous. The European Central Bank is largely autonomous. Uh, so ultimately, all these de decision makers in the uh, world economic processes have to interact with the global financial markets, with the other decision makers in these regulatory policies do, and with their political institutional environment. It's a meta networks of all these networks. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this, the, the impact of this uh, information technology is also even perceived in the, in the, in the conduct of war. Basically, it, it's it's fundamentally changing uh, how states who need to go to war will go to war. Definitely, uh, and the, 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 there are if you wish there are two main developments there. On the one hand, because of the post-Vietnam War syndrome in the United States and and post-Algerian War syndrome in Europe, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, public opinion in most developed countries, uh, I would say in all developed countries is against war. Uh, but not, not only in terms of general uh, values of peace, but people simply don't believe that it's worthwhile to die or to have a fellow compatriot dying for this kind of very complicated strategic geopolitical consideration. After World War, the, the end of the Cold War, and the, the Cold War at least justified for many people the notion that you have to sacrifice, you have to, because the other empire is, is going to, to get us. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, the dramatic threat posed by North Korean invasion of the United States is not credible. Uh, that Iraq was going to strangle uh, the, 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 the oil supply of the West. Uh, in fact, was credible, half credible uh, for a while, and then disappeared. No one thinks that Iraq is it's, uh, it's really a threat for the Western world. Uh, at least not as the most thing would be part of terrorist networks that are part of the, of the new geopolitics. But this is a different kind of war. Uh, so because of that, uh, the, the, the whole strategy has shifted to what I call the development of instant wars. That is, wars that are short enough and uh, overwhelming enough to the adversary that public opinion doesn't even realize what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say the part of the Gulf War was the beginning of this strategy. I say part because it took months, but when it actually started it was 100 hours and finished. Uh, the Bosnia War was in fact planned for three days. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, the Serbia War, the Kosovo War against um, Yugoslavia and Serbia. That was planned for three days, just turned out differently. Mm -hmm. But the, the notion here is through technology, mm -hmm. you target uh, the, the, the key capabilities of your adversary and you try to finish the war in a few hours or if not in a few days. And this is the kind of world we are moving to. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, uh, the, the technology allows it. On the other hand, the public opinion is the only kind of world they take it. Now, this is not all the wars. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of, of dirty, slow, killing wars in the world. Sudan civil war has uh, made two million people killed in the last 20 years. So this is another of these extraordinary disparities in the world. Through technology, the rich countries are able to do instant wars, uh, mm -hmm. while the poor countries go through machete wars uh, 
for years and years. And, and one of the constraints on this war fighting thing is, is really the flow of information. It's not just that people no longer feel their values worth uh, dying for, but uh, their ability to get information about what's happening uh, on the battlefield is the kind of flow that, that uh, uh, leaders who want to engage in war have to respond to. And hence they're forced to get out or in the war quickly. So the, the notion here is that moving from vertical bureaucracies mm -hmm. and vertical organizations of large armies killing each other for centuries to what we, now we are seeing emerging as uh, small units uh, with high power of destruction based mainly on air power and, and Navy supply and at the same time equipped essentially with information and communication. If you don't have information and communication, you are blind and you are destroyed. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way what, what we're seeing in today's world is, is uh, a meeting of, uh, of technology with uh, uh, bureaucratic organizations that, that essentially have to change if, if they're going to adapt to the problems that they confront. Definitely. It's, uh, uh, you see, at this point, the, the, the contradiction between the um, ability of networks to be more productive and more competitive, and the fact that most societies are still rooted in vertical organizations, mm -hmm. in a bureaucratic logic, I am here, I am big. I, I, I can destroy you if, if, if you move because I'm bigger. Uh, in, in, it, it's interesting, in the Silicon Valley culture, there's this say, it's not the, the bigger that wins, but the faster. Uh, one of the legendary uh, business tycoons in the world, uh, Barnevik, who is uh, the, the leader of, of, B, <coughs> of uh, the, the, the major uh, engineering company, uh, uh, BBM, in, in Sweden. Uh, in one of the meetings we had last year, he said, well, my company is the largest engineering company in the world. They're rebuilding entire China, India, South Africa, mm -hmm. etc. We are predicated on the principle, which is complementary to this. If you are the bigger and the fastest, mm -hmm. uh, then you win. Mm -hmm. uh, but what he would not challenge is the notion of you have to, to choose between size and resources and agility and adaptability, no question. Mm -hmm. the, the in between is agility and adaptability that wins. And, but uh, this is simple simple to understand, but difficult to actually implement because people who are currently in power in bureaucracies, in, in uh, political organizations, in large corporations, in universities, are there because uh, they have gone through the hierarchy, they have their clientele, they have their systems of support. Mm -hmm. I, 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 all this is being pushed out by the outcompeting logic of networks, uh, and therefore they will resist to the end. But by resisting, they bring the organizations down with themselves. Now, it doesn't mean that networks, by definition, are wonderful. It can be networks of destruction. So networks don't have personal feelings; they kill or kiss. Uh, <laughs> but the, the the issue here is that. First, you start with a network which is equipped with information technology. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the key. Then what the network does depends on the programming of the network, and this is, of course, a social and cultural process. So, so in addition uh, to organizations, hierarchical organizations, uh, in some cases dinosaurs, if you will, having to adapt to this, this new reality of a networked world. Uh, it's also the case uh, that uh, uh, social movements and social groups have to respond. You write, in a world of global flows of wealth, power, and images, the search for identity, collective or individual, ascribed or constructed, becomes the fundamental source of social meaning. Let's talk a little about that, how the, the irony of globalized flows, on the one hand, leads to a redefinition, a reassertion of identity in localities. And let's relate it, let's say, for example, to the environmental movement. Uh, that's uh, a very good observation because, yes, it is paradoxical. And in fact, it's a paradox that I found empirical in my research. I didn't start like this. I started from the, the technology side, the network side, and then 
I found that part of the story about the transformation of our world did not correspond to that logic, but the, to the logic of resisting the, the, the domination of values implemented through these very effective networks and trying to provide alternative meaning. Uh, here is the, the, the point. On the one hand, these networks are extremely powerful, but on the other hand, they include only what is interesting from the point of view of the values or sources of interest that program this network. Let's say uh, the global capitalist network, left to itself, uh, will include in the network uh, companies, countries, regions, people, that enhance the value of this network in money-making terms. Mm -hmm. Let, this is an extreme uh, situation, but it's not completely, uh, completely away from, from what's happening in the world. Then people who don't have this value, don't have the education, don't have the infrastructure, don't have the institutions, they do what? I mean, they cannot live without these networks, which provide them with everything and capture mm -hmm. every, any wealth from anywhere to process everywhere. And at the same time, uh, they cannot actually contribute to this network, so they are switched off. So what we observe as a reaction, uh, we have we observe two sorts of reactions. Some people and some countries and some regions are saying, well, if you don't value me as producer of bananas, I produce coca. And then I, I, I become part of the cocaine network, and, and then mm -hmm. or I do a smuggling, or I sell uh, women and children, mm -hmm. uh, and it goes into the so-called perverse connection. Well, the global criminal economy is a new phenomenon, yeah. it's interconnected throughout the world, and at this point it's equivalent more or less uh, to, apparently, uh, according to IMF, to about $1.5 trillion in the world, which is about the GDP of the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's one reaction. The other reaction is say, wait a second, if you exclude me in terms of your values from your network, I exclude you. So you, what, I, what I call the exclusion of the excluders by the excluded, and then say, you may be very rich and very technological advanced, but I have God. Mm -hmm. And my God is better than your money. Mm -hmm. And that's different. Or I, I have my, I, my historically rooted ethnic identity. I am a Chiapas Indian. Uh, and as a Chiapas Indian, I don't care about your North American Treaty of Free Trade because you will have to acknowledge me or I will die for it. Uh, and that provides meaning to, to my life. Or I am a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then uh, from the basic values of affirming my specificity as a woman, my equal rights as a woman, my reconstruction of culture as a woman, I don't care if this is not valued in your networks. So I think this is the extraordinary development mm -hmm. that we are seeing in our world. Now this is on the one hand very interesting, but on the other hand is potentially damaging to the coexistence in society because all societies are built around a combination of instrumentality, what we do for working, for organizing, etc., etc., and then meaning, instrumentality and meaning. If we break the world, as we are doing, mm -hmm. into instrumental networks with no meaning for most people and pure meaning but no instrumentality and survival communes, it becomes a very dangerous wall, a wall of aliens, aliens to each other. And, and this uh, goes back to your original point about, well, you didn't say this, uh, but you implied it, namely the reason that you're not a futurologist, that basically it, it's by looking at what happens on the ground, seeing that the reaction to these networks can be one of a reassertion or a redefinition of, of identity that, that helps you understand the complexity of, of what's actually going on in the world. So getting a computer today doesn't necessarily change the world. It's really about how people use the computer and apply it. So an oil company could distribute uh, computers in Nigeria and suddenly discover that they're being used to organize protest movements both locally and internationally. Absolutely. You see, uh, and it goes both ways. On the other hand, uh, as, as much as I think the internet is an extraordinary instrument of creation, free communication, etc., you can use the internet to exclude. Mm -hmm. 
because you can exclude in terms of the access to the network, the digital divide, but you can also exclude in terms of the cultural and education and ability to process all this information that is up in the in the net and then use it for what you want to do because you don't have mm -hmm. the education, the training, the culture uh, to do it, while the elites of the world do. So that's one thing. But on the other hand, what is uh, also uh, uh, expressive of the of the surprises that history prepared. That's why you cannot predict the future, because history is fortunately full of surprises. <laughs> and um, one of the greatest surprises is that suddenly all these movements that were supposed to be traditional, that were supposed to be unable to understand modern progress, they are organizing themselves on the internet. Mm -hmm. And they are using information technology and information systems to actually introduce counter trends to a one-dimensional logic of pure money and instrumentality. As you said, the environmental movement. Mm -hmm. The environmental movement is, first of all, a science-based movement. What most environmentalists do is, with the uh, support of, of scientific experts, they assess the multiple interactions in systemic thinking of what we are doing with our planet, with our environment, with our breathing, with our drinking, with our everything, uh, by measuring or trying to measure mm -hmm. and trying to extrapolate the consequences of a certain type of model of production. Let's be clear, if we include with no change in the same model of production and consumption that we have today, the 50-60% of humankind that is excluded from this level and model of production and consumption, we destroy the planet. So we, are, we can only survive on the basis of extreme inequality. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the uses of, of, of uh, internet are allowing the environmental movement to be at the same time local and global. Mm -hmm. Local in the sense that people are rooted in their problems, in their communities, in their groups, in their identities, but then they act globally. So it's not as, pe as activists used to say, uh, think global, act local. No, no. Uh, it, you think local link mm -hmm. to your interests and values and act global because if you don't act global in a system in which the powers are global, you make uh, no difference in the power system. And that, in spite of all my uh, doubts about some of the elements in the anti-globalization movement, uh, but if I take a vision as a social scientist and not as, as a politician or, 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 or someone who would be uh, interested in determining what is the good and the bad in the movement. As a social scientist, it is a very important movement, objectively speaking, because it's a movement that brings together through the internet in a very flexible way uh, key symbolic demonstrations that uh, hit the system at one point at one time through the media and then disperse its kind of informational guerrilla tactics, if you wish, with different components being part or not part of the movement depending. And of course no possible control. How do you control a movement on the internet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can, you can arrest people or beat up people in a particular demonstration, but the media effect of that, uh, it's in fact what is helping the, the anti-globalization movement to introduce a debate that did not exist until uh, three or four years ago. It was clear in the official uh, ideology of companies, governments, institutions, that globalization was good, uh, mm -hmm. just, just have to explain it to people, technology by definition is good, and if you are quiet and patient for a couple of decades, everybody will be in. Mm -hmm. Well, the anti-globalization movement, right or wrong, has created a space for social and political debate that did not exist. And this is thanks to the ability of environmentalists and other groups to connect with the internet, relate to the public opinion through the media, and connect their locality to the globality by specific events and demonstrations. You, you write in the trilogy, social movements in the information age are essentially mobilized around cultural values. The struggle to change the codes of meaning in the institutions and practice of the society is the essential struggle in the process of social change in the new historical context. Movements to seize the power of the minds, not state power. Well, you see, in, in a, in a so-called information society, uh, minds are not only the most important uh, uh, economic asset, I mean, that's what mm. companies with minds make money, 
company with money and no minds lose the money. Uh, so, uh, and it's the same thing in everything. Uh, so the networks are not programmed by technology, are technological tools programmed by minds. So the human consciousness, because everything now depends on our ability to generate knowledge and process information in every domain of activity, knowledge and information are cognitive qualities from the human mind. Uh, yes, human minds usually are connected to bodies, uh, which uh, means that uh, you have to take into consideration the overall system of human existence, uh, social services support, etc. But fundamentally, the human mind is the, has always been, but more than ever now, uh, the, the source of wealth, power, uh, and, and control over everything. Now, therefore, in a world in which signals processed by our mind are constantly shaping and reshaping mm -hmm. what we do. The ability to influence, to change the categories through which we think our world, is what I call the codes of, of, of our culture, mm -hmm. becomes the essential battle. If you win the battle of minds, you win the battle of politics, the battle of uh, uh, the economy, because people will decide wh what they want to buy or what they don't want to buy, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's take an example. Um, the, in the last 30 years has been the most extraordinary uh, cultural revolution in history. Women have changed the way they think about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, well, once women in certain our countries, uh, but also in most developing countries, uh, is a process towards once women decided that the patriarchal family, that is the institutional domination of, the f of men over women and children in the family, is not correct, that they are equal, and they have to develop their own interests and culture, have their own relationship to work, to everything. Once women ha have changed that, everything changes. Family changes, mm -hmm. uh, therefore socialization of children changes, therefore personality changes, sexuality changes, everything changes. Mm -hmm. And that's the process we are in. Environmentalists, if you introduce the notion that production is not just growth, but sustainable development, everything from the way we work, to the way we produce, to the way we consume, is affected by this cultural transformation. And in democratic societies, this in fact translates also into politics, translates into choices, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's a complicated matter there because the battle of the minds is not simply the social movement changing the cultural codes of society, but the powers that be rephrasing the old categories with new words and new images, but without changing of meaning like most of the so-called ecological thinking of many governments, which in fact are not so mm -hmm. interested in, in environmental sustainability. So it's a battle. But what I mean these days, the same thing that in money terms, uh, ideas and talent are ultimately the source of productivity and competitiveness, the same thing in terms of the overall social organization, how people change their mind determines how they change their behavior, and the change of behavior is what ultimately translates in the overall social organization. And, and your, your analysis uh, is subtle uh, in the sense that a superficial look at the world would suggest uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the conglomerates, uh, uh, the mega corporations, are completely riding in the saddle and in charge of the direction of society. But in fact, uh, by, by looking at this more complex milieu, one sees, as you write, that ecologists, feminists, religious fundamentalists, nationalists, and localists are the potential subjects of the information age, that they can, in essence, come up with categories of thinking and responses that affect the way uh, uh, technology changes the world around us. Definitely. But you see, uh, well, first of all, there is uh, this, this general uh, misunderstanding that corporations run the world. Corporations run what they can run. But to start with, they don't even run the economy because they are dependent of an uncontrollable system, which is the global financial markets. Corporations, they have their money uh, in the financial markets. They depend on how investors perceive them and value them in the global financial market. 
uh, in March uh, 2000, uh, Cisco Systems, which is a very good company in many ways, uh, in terms of the, the, the practice of the company, I don't, uh, I, I don't say that in terms of the values, but in terms of the practice of the company, a very effective company, uh, was valued $550 billion and was the largest, the highest valued company in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in March uh, 2001, one year later, uh, mm -hmm. was valued about $120 billion and had collapsed in the stock market. Still great company, 85% of the internet equipment market and so on. So the turbulences of information that control the financial markets, the, 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 uh, the ability or not ability of companies to ride the, the, the subjectivity of financial markets uh, determines uh, the, the, the fate of the company. So in that sense, uh, companies do not run the world because they cannot even control the global economy. It's a multiplicity of factors and influences. It's not a, an executive committee of the capitalist class running the world. Uh, but on the other hand, it also uh, companies and governments don't run the world because uh, more and more you have alternative actors, social movements of all kind, identity communal movements as well as proactive movements such as environmentalists, women, etc., that ultimately shape the agenda of both corporations and government institutions. Governments in the world at this point have a tremendous crisis of legitimacy. Uh, Kofi Annan and the fall of 2000 uh, commissioned a, a global survey of citizens' opinions in the world which showed that two-thirds of citizens in the world uh, did not consider themselves represented by their governments. Mm -hmm. And this was also true for the uh, advanced democracies, United States and others, with the only exception of the Scandinavian democracies. So, uh, Citizens are not trusting their governments, by and large, these days. Are not trusting, in fact, anyone, except themselves and their identity networks, and in some cases, social movements with alternative values. And in that sense, the complexity of our world is that the institutions of governance are crumbling, while on the one hand, networks of technology, capital, production are organizing our lives throughout the world, and many, many different alternative sources of uh, values and interests are emerging as response to this one-sided domination because they do not have institutions through which they can process their claims and their demands. So, so in the context of this, this new world emerging that you're describing, uh, you, you were sanguine about the, the possibilities of uh, the individual. Is that correct? You have a, a positive view of what the individual can still do? I do, although as, as you probably have noticed and most people have criticized me for, in, in my work, at, at least in the trilogy, uh, I am very shy about any prescription or any normative attitude. I try to be as analytical as possible. It doesn't mean that I don't care about the world, it's obvious that I do, but I, I think my role is mainly to provide analytical tools for people then decide what they want to do. Uh, but individuals, yes, uh, and this has two aspects. I think if, if we would need one word to characterize in social terms, in terms of values and organization, our world, is the growing juxtaposition of individualism and communalism. The two things are happening. Uh, in, in most uh, people in our advanced societies, but also in, in others, are building their projects as individuals, in the family, in the economy, in everything. Even in the economy, people train themselves with the idea of having individual portfolios, which you can negotiate with different people. So we are in a world of individuals. And the internet, actually, is very good for that, because uh, rather than creating virtual communities that practically don't exist, what exists is networks of individuals, in which uh, it provides the basis for increasing, not decreasing our sociability, but our sociability as individuals. On the other hand, people that don't feel as strong as individuals, then they build trenches, trenches of resistance, and they close the commune. 
for instance, religious fundamentalism, for instance, uh, nationalism, uh, extreme nationalism. Uh, so we, we have individuals and communes, and in between, the civil society and the state kind of, if not vanish, they are dramatically weakened. And the, the civil society and the state were in fact the institutions that emerged as forms of social organization in the industrial age. One final question and requiring a brief answer because we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, you have said that the 21st century will not be a dark age. It may well be characterized by informed bewilderment. Uh, how should students prepare for the future in a network society? I think education is more important than ever, but is, education is not simply the traditional form of education. It's to develop what I call self-programming capabilities. That is the ability to adapt, to learn to learn, and to learn how to use the knowledge uh, into the implementation of the projects and their tasks throughout their life. So building on the one hand the knowledge capability to not to have lots of information, but to know how to find information and how to recombine this information, what they want, which ultimately means to be very good and very strong in a broad educational range. Good mathematics, good verbal skills, good writing skills, a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of <laughs> history and geography, sounds traditional, and then Computers will come, I and mean, computers will do the work almost automatically by, by themselves. One, we know what to ask the computers. And on the other hand, on the personality side, uh, in a world which is constantly changing, uh, it is essential that education helps to provide what I call a combination of secure personalities and flexible personalities. Flexible personalities because young people are going to go through extraordinary transformation in their life. Finish the notion that you find your partner, you marry, you have children, <laughs> da, da, da. no, 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 get ready for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and to reconstruct your life constantly. And so, flexibility. But no so totally flexible that you don't know who you are. So at the same time, in order to have a strong, relatively secure personality, you need values but not many values, because many values cannot be as strong. I mean, you go crazy with so many values. A few solid values, such as don't do to the others what you don't want the others to do to you. <laughs> right. uh, if you have a good family, stick to it. Uh, uh, take care of children. They, they are good people until you make it bad. I mean, a few of these uh, fundamental tolerance, I mean, a few of these fundamental values, not too many, anchor deeply defend it, and then flexibility. So self-programming capabilities, education, 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 a few solid values, and flexibility to open up to life. Press, uh, Professor Castells, on that uh, a very uh, intriguing and positive note about preparing for the future, thank you very much for taking the time uh, uh, to be with us today and, and uh, give us an exposure uh, to your uh, uh, journey of your life and also your, your intellectual journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. A and privilege. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.